The idea to um, have a meeting that is a bit more generic than uh, than only like Lisa, like we've done in the past, has come also because uh, there is such a diversity of uh, new projects at STAN that we felt that in the future we, uh, we wanted to cover uh, a bit more ground than we've done in the past. Also, as you all know, um, the junction developments uh, developments also in building um, objects for museum. Uh, lots of project people in the house have also taken up a, a lot of our uh, resources, and that has also slowed down some developments again. And so we're looking into uh, into new ways to deal with that, and we will t I will tell you a little bit about that to begin with. And so this is probably one of the last time that, that we're focusing on, on sort of mainly Lisa users, as, as a lot of you are. It could be, uh, and hopefully it will be a more mixed crowd. We've also aimed our invitation very much at the Lisa crowd. So it is, you are also a little bit of a guinea pig for, uh, for the new kind of uh, January uh, spirit at Stein. I will tell you uh, uh, first uh, a little bit about the developments at Stein, more detail about research especially, and about some, some projects that we've been doing. And after that, it will be indeed, uh, we'll do a focus on Lisa, and we'll show you something uh, that has come out earlier than we thought. It's an interesting development for Lisa on the new machines. And um, it is all meant as an informal meeting, so if you feel like interrupting or asking questions, uh, it's fine. Um, the idea is to, uh, to really get as much feedback as possible to hear about your experiences. The round table at the end of this afternoon is really meant to just sit and, and hear uh, from each other what we've been doing, a bit more in, a, you know, not too much programmed, uh, uh, meeting form, so if you feel like talking about something totally different uh, that is maybe even more important than everything we're talking about right now, it's not forbidden. So, first I will um, tell you a little bit about what's been brewing uh, at Stein. And the major um, research topics have moved a little bit away from, you know, this whole area of touch. It has moved uh, uh, this idea that, that the, the direct touch relationship from our bodies with the machines, I think Stein has made the point. You know, we, we've been with working in this area for so long, so many other people uh, have picked it up or came to similar conclusions, and there's so many companies bringing out stuff. 
that is usable. Uh, we think there's also a lot of uh, institutes that do much more specific research and gesture analysis and sometimes very academic, but maybe in the end still useful for our community. We really felt with the little amount of resource we have, we've made our point and we should move on. That doesn't mean we will stop uh, supporting stuff we've done in this field or we will not lose interest because as you will see what we will focus on and what we are focusing on has very much to do with it. But it means that where we have a bit of money to do research, um, that money will be spent on, on other uh, topics. And one of the main topics is energy. And so if, you, if you've if you created a, a touchy-feely relationship with your instrument, and you are sort of in contact, and there is a kind of balance between you know, what happens with your ideas and what happens with your body and how you play it, then um, that's something that is really there. But then, um, what happens in that whole process with energy? So for most of us, it's totally normal and even adorable that we plug in our system in the wall and use community energy that is provided, you know, most of the time in these countries in a relatively reliable way. Uh, Daniel and Jorgen have traveled a lot for time in countries where that wasn't totally reliable, and it was very interesting to see what how solutions were sometimes being really found. And also, sometimes we've done workshops in countries in other places where we brought our fancy equipment and people could not even really afford it or even uh, deal with it after we left. So that's an other aspect that I'm mentioning. And because every time I start talking about this topic, people think this is a kind of green energy uh, uh, propaganda, which, uh, of course, I'm not totally against at all. But I want to make clear that the main focus of this research is about what is the relationship of the production of energy whatever, where it comes from, and musical expression. In this case, it's very much focused on musical expression. So, the fact that, that you have this endless stream of energy coming out of the wall, and you can just feed it into your machines, and you just stand there and operate it, nudge it a little bit, it's totally normal for us, and we like it. You know, some people, uh, you know, play clarinets, and they have to put air in it all the time, and it keeps them pretty busy all the time and uh, and the rest of the time they have to do the musical thing. So there's a lot of, there, there, it was a very luxurious start for a lot of electronic music who have never invested energy of their own body into their instrument. But for the sake of the research, and it's really uh, like a dogma that we consciously choose, we say, so what happens if you don't use energy from the mix? You stop that link and just for sake of research, what happens if the energy has to come from the body of the player? So the player has to make movements, shake or turn, or move you know, the whole body, whatever, and the energy coming from the body is being fed to this new kind of instrument. Now right away, the face of electronic music changes completely. You know, the pieces are way shorter. <laughs> it's much softer because we produce really little energy with our bodies. And um, so what happens? You know, you ask people for help again. So instead of maybe going to the, the, the city power station, you ask people in the audience maybe to make energy. So you get a very interesting relationship with your audience, you know, because they get tired maybe if you don't make the right music and they stop. You could get energy from all kinds of processes. Now, this is... Uh, a very interesting topic, especially I presented it at the ERCOM, uh, at the NIME conference, and there people, even before I came to this point, got really angry. There's a man who stood up and said, but, but uh, uh, we have now a community with Max MSP, and we have computers, and, and we talk to each other, we speak the same language, and now you want to fuck it up, you know, like... <laughs> And I said, yes, that is what a community is about. That is that if everyone is happy with the communication, some people can get out and, and you know explore other areas. But it doesn't mean we will say everyone should follow us, you know. And but we might come back with interesting results. There's just a position that 
Stein is not going to say, oh, drop it all. It's, it's really for the sake of this research. So we're looking into um, building instruments that, that, you know, of course, the first thing you think of is piezo, because piezo, you hit piezo, it produces electricity, send it to another piezo, and it transduces, it, again, that electricity into air vibrations. But what happens in between? And, of course, there's a whole range of possibilities in that area. Of course, we are, again, with uh, some kind of army research centers in the area. As usual, when you do crazy stuff, you find these people researching all this stuff for their soldiers in the field, how to hide them in the bushes for months and have them produce their own energy. And some of it comes from chemical processes. Some of it comes from uh, kinetic uh, and motoric uh, processes. There is a lot happening in the field. There's also people who have done already projects in this area, and we're not looking, you know, to produce like number one products, but we're looking into what will it mean for our music if next year we sit together here and you get this little instrument on your lap and we do a jam session. And what will it mean musically? What's the difference when you cannot really bring your own sounds? When you know it's not very loud? When you know you have to work? And there is some really interesting stuff coming out from just early experience. So this is one area of research where we're focusing, where we're looking for collaborations. So uh, any information or effort or power uh, is uh, welcome. Another topic uh, that we're looking into is a project that is called Composing the Now. Uh, I don't know, I know it's not the same for every country, but Holland with its Calvinist uh, tradition has a very strong um, that division uh, starts to occur again between, you know, what is improvised, what is composed. It's even, you know, like you get more money when it's composed and you get less money when you're like an improviser, which to me is like a total contradiction because, you know, if you have little time to think, that thinking is you know, uh, worth a lot of money, uh, in my opinion. Uh, anyway, uh, there's the same story about studio and life. Uh, also there, we see more and more people who bring everything they have in their studio on stage and do their concerts. Also, this is a studio where a lot of studio productions have been done, but we do a lot of concerts. There's concerts being done in a little studio next door. And we see in many places that the practice of people is changing completely. When Boulez, uh, I think more than 20 years ago, could say, you know, that improvisation would never yield um, in invention, it would never allow a composer to progress because while, improvis while improvising you couldn't reflect on what you were doing. And uh, I mean, at that time maybe he had a point, although some people, surely with the help of drugs, <coughs> play extremely fast and think very fast and reflect very fast while improvising. But I think now with, with our laptop systems, we are able to indeed, as I said, you know, you can start processes and step back and listen, reflect on it while you're on stage. You can build up an experience in in composing, improvising, operating, you, you know, all these different roles are within our means. And that's an incredible difference that actually Boulez helped uh, to work on by making the 4X, the famous 4X computer that apparently never really worked. But, uh, you know, there, it, times have really changed. But uh, this project, the Composing the Now project, has a Dutch cultural politics strategic aspect that we want to make clear, you know, come on, times have changed. You cannot just say that people who, who play at Kraakgeluiden series and improvise, that they should just get like 100 euro a gig and other people, you know, 400, and just for sitting in and presenting an idea and then getting thousands later. I mean, it's, it's really, really a little bit too ridiculous. So there is a, there's a cultural political side of this project. But the other project, which we are in the process of starting up, is really about, um, so what is it what we do? What is this composing aspect? What, what are we planning? And how much of the planning is, is, gets incorporated in our machines, in our movements? Because, you know, like 10 years of practice on the violin is also an investment in the body, and that body has all that knowledge 
ready to come out. I mean, that is, you could say, composing too. There is, there is many ways of, of seeing how this totally get interlocked. And, and so in the end, it is about decision making. And it is about, about how do you build up contexts that are readily available. So for instance, uh, to just give an example, uh, <clears throat> as most of you know, I, I play this instrument and, and Lisa has, uh, has a lot of sounds stored and structures and uh, I have uh, like 24 keys immediately at my disposal so it's very easy to have like 24 e either sounds ready under those to load and then play with them or presets, whatever. But anyway, it's possible to have a certain amount uh, a selection of my huge arguments of sound ready for that concert. So what I do now is I select these sounds and think, well, I think today I'm going to play with those. That person needs a bit of watery sounds in the background, so I'll, I'll add some water. I, you know, like, I just prepare my little palette like, like a painter does with chords, and it's there. But of course, while you're playing, you might want to navigate to another sound, and in the way I work, that is possible. But it is still like usually four or five E presses away, which in musical terms I find too far away. It can be done easier, but that demands a big change of the hardware, and I don't want to change the hardware because then I cannot play properly anymore because I restrict myself consciously to not changing the hardware so that I master my instrument maybe one day. So, you know, there's the, all these little compromises in order to play well, but also reach a lot of stuff. You could make a much better navigation instrument than, than I've done here. So, what would happen if you have an instrument that helps you with decision making? You know, I could have all these sounds in a library and tag them, give them several tags. This one, if I ever play with Uli again, uh, this is a Uli ready sound. So if I play with you, you know, so I could have all these totally subjective tags and I could create an analysis system that looks, you know, oh, well, maybe, so there's one palette that I don't fill, but that's being filled by the system and, and it will give me chances based on my earlier tagging and on analysis of what I'm doing. Now, all of you know that that's not as simple as I'm saying, uh, you know, so how do you anal analyze, analyze, analyze it? And um, what's, what basic, what, how, how do you listen to it? So you could even have another person do it. But what I mean to say is that you could design a system that helps you, supports you, you know, like ha happens in hospitals all the time now. So it's, it is really like a system that basically is totally programmed by you, but it has a little bit of behavior by itself by making choices. And you can narrow the choices, you can widen the choices. So still, I would be the one who chooses what is being presented to me. That's the way I like it. But you know that like people like George Lewis in the past, or still doing now, would have a system that just goes its own way based on rules that we set. So there's all kind of interaction types possible where uh, you've done some of that rule setting in the beginning a long time ago and you're being confronted and you play it on stage. And, and the other end is what Clarence Barlow did at some point, is to make a system that you feed it some notes and it is able to totally play exactly what, what you fed it, but with faders, uh, with a hardware box, you can change parameters of this process. So in, in that way, he would play like a Beethoven uh, sonata you know, on a piano, <laughs> and then, then the, the system would take that as an input, and then at some point it would really take over and sort of do exactly what he had done, because it was a kind of loop going on. And then he would slip, move to that fader box, and he would then start, you know, opening up um, variations. Like you could say, well, you can be less precise about timing, or you can move to other harmonic uh, liberties. You know, you could do that in percentage, rate, just a little bit, or totally, just totally derive from staying in that harmonic structure. So he had a system that would play back exactly what you had prepared or planned even though it was, in this case, done on stage. But it could gradually be opened up to do completely different things, and that could be done by, by you changing the rules live. So I'm just mentioning a few ways 
with which uh, you know you're kind of assisted uh, or in a debate in some case by systems that that um, help you compose on stage. Now this whole thing about composing the now is really about the fact that and we've seen now a lot of people go on stage with their equipment but still stay in a studio reality. There's still, you know, I, I have a very uh, long ago a lot of uh, uh, an experience in playing with Steve Lacey and other jazz people and also a lot of free jazz people and, and they think it's all ridiculous what we do. They don't see it as musical at all and I don't subscribe to it but I understand that this lack of direct uh, response to other people. I've played with Leticia Sonami, who has a very flexible setup, but she was criticizing her own system because she couldn't move as fast to things when we were improvising. So we've seen a lot of people come here and want to know, you know, how how can can you work out this idea that that you can change your setup fast? We've we've talked with Zicarelli uh, of cycling. Is it true? that Max MSP forces you to make systems that are sort of unchangeable. And we both ended up thinking, no, it's not. But, but you know, uh, a lot of people don't work in a systematic uh, modular way, or they you start working in a nice modular way, and then gradually, you know, you start to grow in all these directions. We all know how nice that is to keep fiddling and, and make a system that in the end is not very flexible anymore. So we made this nice plan because we do a very stupid, simple job by, by saying this eye is this and it can only do that. You know, you, you kind of stay away from that, that risk a bit, not completely as, as we also know. So we, we were really talking about, so one day we should sit together and, and do suggestions, work with some Max MSP programs that are considered good by, by the community and, uh, and, uh, and see um, whether we could derive, you know, like presets or modular uh, laws, if you want to say it in a rough way, uh, from from practice and see, and use that as suggestions to a way that that will allow you to have a much more flexible setup when when you know engaging with other people and or just straight with yourself in a musical stage. A lot more can be said, and I will. I will just stop here about uh, uh, the composing and now you, you sort of get, it's a, it's a project that is also about decision making in, in general, you know, what is a decision, what is, what, is, what is what you're really doing when on the decisive moment, what is the decisive moment, is that, is that something that is like a, a, a moment where you can go many directions and you choose one, or is it uh, the, a build-up of all kind of directions that come together in that single specific moment. Philosophically, you can look at that in, in much more ways than I'm just doing right now. But already that distinction, is it a coming together or is it you know, a, a choice for many other directions? It, it, it is very interesting stuff and we intend also to work with people um, who, who've done more thinking on, in this area in psychological terms, but also in social terms, um, and um, and it might be a project that also gets out of the pure musical realm a little bit. So uh, I can go on uh, naming uh, many more projects. Uh, I should only mention three more that I consider important. The, our activities in the educational field have, uh, I think, tripled or, or even uh, gone up higher more. We get a lot of interest for short uh, orientation projects, for specific workshops. Uh, they're sometimes not at all in the Lisa area. Their, their junction, as you all know, has, has become pretty popular in certain scenes, also especially in the VJ area, uh, who are just happy users who give very little feedback, but buy and buy. There's a lot of money apparently there. Uh, and they use the most simple uh, version we have quite often. Other people have gone into the junction as, it, as it's developing. There's also a lot of visual artists and theater people that are interested in it. And it means we get a really different kind of crowd in the house. And it's, uh, it's great, we're happy, but it's very rough to deal with so many different areas. So uh, we might make choices also in the educational activity field. We, we think it's very important, but we don't get the support from our government, Ministry of Culture 
to properly bring this as, as light of an organization slightly outside our research facilities, which would be better in the end. So in the end, we might uh, uh, go and work with educational institute as we've already been doing, but to more extended ways uh, to, uh, to host uh, our workshops and courses, maybe somewhere else, and just only have some key uh, meetings uh, in here. Uh, I think also, I've briefly mentioned it, the fact that uh, people are discovering more of what we're doing. There's a new generation really discovering the, 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 what they think is the importance of our work. And um, uh, that means that we also get a lot more invitations to, do, to build stuff. So we have had this big project in a museum in The Hague where they wanted a kind of wonder instrument in what they call their wonder rooms which is uh, you know, one of those uh, attempts to break open the stiff uh, uh, art museum for a wider audience and to sort of make it into a kind of arcade. Or, and uh, you should judge for yourself. It's in The Hague. It's called the Gemeente Museum. And it's, it's, uh, it's great now that it's finally working, but it was for us also like an extremely time consuming and very educational experience to work with other big structures. You know, we've never worked with such big structures where people simply don't want to work sometimes. You know, we were really surprised to find out that the system wasn't working and it could have been repaired. Everything was there and they simply don't do it because they have to be in trouble with another boss of another department. All of you know this stuff, but for time it's been really a new kind of field to go into to um, to, 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 you know, apply LISA and, uh, and Junction and all our knowledge into these projects that are being harassed by uh, angry school children uh, every day and every hour of that day. And so, uh, believe us, it's, uh, we're learning a lot, but in a real rough way. And it's good. So, I think uh, I've given enough of, uh, you know, a quick overview of some um, of our main uh, activities. Um, it, yeah, yeah. And uh, Frank is mentioning uh, the Touch Mobile, that's the exhibition. Uh, some of you might know we had this exhibition of a lot of uh, uh, big uh, installations and objects, instruments, and we're moving to a smaller version where we try out little sensors and and instruments. Frank will be able to tell you more later in the week. It will also be set up for the open days for those of you who stay longer, but uh, we can also give you information. But it's a very good testing ground and it, it's easy to set up for a few days with very little money. So also we're, we're on the road with it more. And it's really like our prototype area. And this is an area where we experiment a lot with single sensor technology. Uh, the, the idea that you use one sensor and that you really look at little shaking patterns or repetitive patterns in one movement so that instead of all this multi-sensor stuff that we used to do that you, um, that you take one sensor and you look at the departure speed for instance and then you analyze it in a split second and you decide okay this is that one, that choice, it's so fast well in that case the rest of the movements is interpreted, interpreted so and so so it means that from one sensor you get much more behavior, you get much more musical things. So if you have a little object that you can move around, you know, little changes in movement will suddenly have a lot more meaning. So it's not just, oh, warm, cold, or red, green, or, you know, the really stupid things that we're used to by now. So, so it's, it's a very interesting uh, confrontation to put this out in all these in different, uh, for these different audiences. Yeah, I should, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, th there's probably more information that I should tell, but I think this is enough for an introduction, and there's going to be enough occasions to talk uh, later this week, and, and if you have specific information, feel free to uh, ask us. So, I think now we should finally then uh, get into the Lisa business, and uh, I'm happy and delighted uh, to see that you guys are here, and Frank is here. Uh, we remember earlier this year a moment where a lot of people were having doubts whether Lisa would ever continue. 
I'm aware that uh, we fed this ourselves by, by telling some people informally, well, we are a bit here in the work, and we were really stu stuck also uh, in all these other projects that, that I've just been mentioning. Um, it, some of your people's uh, uh, worries have really helped us, have given us a little push in the back to, uh, to, uh, to do something about it. And uh, I'm happy uh, that, uh, to announce that uh, Frank will also show today that we have something running. And, uh, and it looks very good and it's a lot earlier than we thought. And that's also one of the reasons we wanted to organize this uh, little meeting now, because we can take it home. And, um, and I think I should just start talking now. Mm -hmm. Give it to Frank. Are there any questions, maybe? When you mentioned uh, different versions of the Jacobin Institute, uh, I think that's when you're still supporting the first one? We're still selling it. Still selling. And I think supporting the... <laughs> I never had problems with it. That no, that's why. needed support, so. But we I, give, like, I like it. No, yeah. the, the latest version is basically the one that is still continuing to be developed. Is that 2? Yeah, no, now it's 2.6. Yeah. What about 1? Is that still. Yeah, version 1.4 is the oldest version, and that one, for example, is not the universal binary. Oh, okay. While the new ones. They are all universal binary. Anyway, so universal binary is the magic word these days. Because when Apple announced that they were going to switch to another processor, uh, a lot of people were excited about it and a lot of people were not excited about it. Actually, when this machine, and this is a MacBook Pro, was announced, I was extremely excited, I have to say. And uh, it was uh, another opportunity. It meant uh, you know, trying to get things running on new machines and so on. And I knew already from day one that when I was developing Junction, because that was a lot of my work, uh, let's say last year, was done for that program. It was that I knew that even before I had the machine, it was able to run on the new computers because I had created the program in the Apple developing development environment called Xcode. And uh, so when I got this machine, the first thing of course I did was start the function. Wow, smooth, low processor load. And then I tried to open the setup and I could not open any setup at all. So this was my first confrontation about the difference in processes. And it took me another three weeks to fix this problem. And it was something in the way data is stored on an Intel processor or a Power PC. So although the idea was that the transition would be easy, as if my program was already ready for the Intel processors, it was not as easy as I thought. Um, of course, another test, very important test, was Lisa running, and I knew that Lisa would run not natively on the machine, but on the Rosetta, as it's called. And everything looked okay. So I was happy about that. The thing is, the program like Lisa started a long time ago. It's been about 10 years now that we started with the very first lines of code. And so the program has grown and grown and grown and grown. And 10 years in computer world is a long time. So there's a lot of stuff in the code where I thought, oh, this is brilliant design, which is not so smart anymore to do it anymore, or not necessary anymore. I have all kinds of tricks in design to make it extremely uh, speed efficient. And nowadays, who cares? I mean, these machines are so fast that all these special tricks are not necessary anymore. The gain in speed is nothing compared to the overall speed of the processes. But the problem is that these so-called very efficient pieces of code 
put down a number of restrictions. Like, for example, the fact that in Lisa you cannot control more than 32 parameters. The whole basic low level structure of Lisa is that I have no more space to add other parameters. And nowadays I'm doing a completely different work. So, the thing was, what am I going to do? Am I going to make <coughs> Lisa port of a universal binary? Well, there's so much old code in there. The other problem that I was confronted with was the fact that Lisa was developed in a programmer's environment called CodeWarrior. And this is a programmer's environment that was actually quite popular amongst uh, Apple software developers. And uh, I know about two or three years ago, Apple started pushing their own development environment called Xcode more and more and more. And at a certain time, it became clear that Xcode would be programmed to use to create these so-called universal binaries. I initially still had hopes that CodeWarrior would go on. But the problem was that the CodeWarrior development package was about 900 euro, while Xcode is for free. Everybody of you who has a Mac has Xcode. You get it. If you want to be a programmer, you can start programming right away. And so there's no competition in there. So CodeWarrior said, we're going to stop Apple support completely. Which was a shock for me, because it meant I had to port all my code to the other environment. And that's also for Junction, that also took me a lot of work. Since Junction was built you know, from start in OS 10, it was not so much of a problem as with, as with uh, Lisa. And uh, then I had to decide, okay, now I'm going to make it a universal binary. So I gave it some tries and very quickly I was confronted with about five to 6,000 errors. And a lot of these errors I knew this, I could sort of work around it, but it will not be good. So we had to make a decision, it's not a good idea to keep on adding new layers of code on this already quite old program. We have to do something different. Of course, Junction now has a lot of features which basically were also built in Lisa. Things like mini processes, meta control, uh, modulators, and so on. All that kind of stuff is also available in Junction. So I started thinking about maybe we should make a Lisa, which basically has nothing, just audio engines. And all the control is done with Junction. And I started spreading some of the rumors. And very quickly, people became excited, but not really in a positive way. Like, oh shit, and how do I deal with all my <coughs> setups? And what do I have to do now? So, you know, there's sometimes we have to make choices. What are we going to do? Are we going to make a program bigger and bigger and bigger, add more and more features? Or at some point, do you say, it's too fat, we have to slim uh, to trim it down and make it a very small program? At this moment, it's still quite old. Because one of the first things, when I started experimenting with the uh, Lisa for the interprocessors, I thought of what I should do. I think that would be a nice uh, gesture to the Lisa audience, that for people who are confronted with the fact that they cannot use an old machine anymore, they are forced to buy a new computer, that at least they will have an optimal piece of code for that machine. So I thought I'm going to strip down Lisa as it is, get rid of the whole user interface, basically take the MIDI and the audio engines and build a new simple interface with some visual feedback on top of it, made it completely all stand ready um, for the whole new system because a lot of stuff under the hood has changed. I have to change a lot of code and make sure that there is a sort of player 
available which runs optimized on the new machines. And that is what I've been doing since our announcement at the end of August. And I can say that it, uh, it works. I have the whole thing running under Xcloud. It's extremely efficient. Um, one of the ways to test new processes for me always was do voice counting. Now, how many voices do I get when I have a new machine? It was always the first test that I did. <coughs> Physically, in Lisa as it is now, uh, there is a limitation of 128 voices. And I had to raise that level. And on these machines, which are the two gigahertz dual core machines, I get more than 500 voices. So, what are we talking about? You know, huge choirs. I mean, it's not, voice uh, count is not an issue anymore. You will have enough. So, um, what I want to show you, of course, is this new version. Although there's not so much to show, there's no editing, but it, will, it has a nice visual feedback. I will show you some features um, or some, some issues that I now have discovered about Lisa running uh, under Rosetta. Because what you have to realize is you can use Lisa under Rosetta, create your setups, do all the testing, and then when you're performing, you just open the player version, and I call it Lisa XC, where you can say X4. And um, there you open your setup, and it will run much more efficiently. So basically, you still have your old program available on your machine, because that is what you need to create all the setups. The interesting thing is that some of you may have used Lisa uh, version 1.2.5 already on under Rosetta and have not encountered any problem at all. Uh, it's, it's definitely less efficient than on a 1.5 gigahertz power group, but since these machines are really fast, and most of you never need more than 32 voices or whatever, it's not really an issue. But there are some situations which are critical. And I, when I, I had, of course, I also have lots of setups. And when I was initially trying Lisa for some setups, I had some fine, everything worked fine with some other setups. That's weird. You know, sometimes hiccups. And what's going on? Then when I started porting the whole code to the Intel machines, at a certain moment, I discovered that some of my setups had very irregular CPU loads. And that's a, a particular setup which, had, which I used to create setups where basically you just hit one button and everything goes on. <laughs> because then I, can, I know that whenever I do it again, I get exactly the same, uh, how do you say that, uh, performance. So for, especially when you're testing, it's very useful because you can always see where things start to go wrong. And in this particular case, I had a setup where for two minutes everything was fine. There were about 16 voices running, and the CPU load was about 8 9 percent. And then after two minutes, my CPU load suddenly went up to 30 percent. And then you say, well, who cares? I mean, it's still running these machines on fast. I found that very strange, and I had no idea what was going on. Well, that took me about a week to figure out what was going on. There is apparently an important difference between Intel processor and the uh, PowerPC processor. And I can show that, actually, here. Here I have Lisa running under Rosetta, of course, and I can start up a voice. Like this. And if we look at the CPU load now, 
So this was an interesting problem. And my uh, initial thought was, hey, maybe this is another bug of Intel, because I think more than 10 years ago, Intel released a processor which had a famous bug inside where they had to recall millions of processors because this had to do with uh, high precision calculations and so on. But no, actually, the Intel processor is, uh, how do you say that? Um, it has a higher resolution of calculator. If you start to do, so if you start working with really small numbers, really, really small numbers, then it appears that a PowerPC processor rounds off those numbers to zero. The Intel processor can still calculate with those numbers, but it needs more CPU load. They can deal with it, but it's a heavier load on the processor. So I finally discovered some kind of obscure document which said that audio developments, developers, you know, be aware of that fact, and so on, and so on. And it means basically that in the code I have to do some kind of you know, rounding off for those small numbers, make sure that they become zero and not be state as a really long number. So that problem is fixed. The thing is that uh, if you have certain setups where you notice there is a weird behavior in certain rays of CPU loads, and I have to say this is only on the Intel machines, uh, then you can solve this problem by making sure that especially volumes in filters or in patterns that they are not completely zero. It's also a combination of stuff. If you have just a sound which is no has uses no filter and where you just change the, the, the volume to zero, there's no problem at all. But when you use a filter, uh, there will always be a little residue, and it's too technical to ex explain what's going on, but there will always be a little residue, and that number will be in the order of 10 to the minus 45th or something, so it's really, really small. And um, that is where you start running into problems. And I have setups, if I start them on this machine, uh, on, on this uh, version of Lisa, they will uh, 
you know, I will get uh, audio device overload uh, very quickly. Um, I have a number of setups where even the modulators cannot keep up in speed anymore because the CPU load is so low, so high. So those were all excellent test setups to see if how it would run in my uh, my player. Anyway, so what I will do now is quit the program and let's start up the player. And this is how the player looks like. It's just one main window and. Um, it has some, uh, some info, uh, sort of resize status window. And in here I can open the setup. So what you see is you get the sample information that's loaded. You still get the zoom uh, things in the status window. You get the amount of voices that are playing, the CPU loads, the MIDI messages, the file info, preset. And this little window, and this pane you might say, which comes from the assignment window, which basically shows you the parameters that you're using and with graphic bars, it will show you the value of the uh, drawer. And so, so when I send data, it will be shown here as well. There is, there are a few options. Oh, sorry about the junction. This one, basically, uh, those are options that are also available in the program, of course. And what is very important, there is a preferences pane. And so here you can still, when you have opened your setup, you can still decide to change uh, the audio device uh, settings. Uh, if you want to use the built-in input of the microphone, or if you have an external audio <coughs> device, Michelle will use it with a, a Motu, what is this thing called? Traveler? No, it's not the Ultralight. <coughs> the Ultralight audio interface. Um, so these things can be changed in here. There is a MIDI department where you can select which ports you are using, the familiar control things. So a lot of sort of global settings in Lisa, which were all separate, like the buffer size, and so on, and so on. Now they are completely together in a preferences window. General part. The buffer size, by the way, you cannot change because it doesn't make much sense since it's part of your setup. The meta control channels and the envelope followers and the pitch trackers. So all this stuff can be set up here. Now, for people who uh, don't have such a great vision, you can also zoom. And uh, so there is a default size window, but you can also click on the zoom box and it will fill your own desktop. And let's see. Sound.
play uh, about nine and a half quarters sounds. And with the sustain on. Since the processors and the hard disk and so on, these machines are faster. I mean, my buffer now is what is it, in almost three minutes, and loading a file is still almost instant. So I don't think this will be a major issue. And uh, so this. Version the shell is uh, has uh, how do you say that uh, transferred his whole setup <coughs> design to the uh, iMac. This is also uh, a new Intel machine, and uh, just to show you that it's not just for a demo. I mean, the shell is playing with it already, and everything. Of course, for us, it's very much a test. It's been a testing phase. But it looks like everything is really secure and very stable. So, so it's, it's very much an intermediate phase where, where you know, this is the first thing we got running as fast as possible on the new machine. Yeah. It basically uh, allows me to work in my old setups and my old Lisa, so to say. And then once the, the, that is done, uh, I open it in the player. So there's nothing conversion or stuff like that. It just uh, uh, you know, it happens. I don't see much difference in that. It, of course, if I want to change something, if I edit something, I have to uh, uh, add, open the other one again and, and do it there. But it's, I've been doing this now for a number of days, and it's, uh, it's, I've been editing sounds, and so I also had other programs open to work on the sounds, and it all was going on next to each other. Uh, I noticed there's a, a slightly more headroom uh, in this version, so the, the total level right away when you play one voice is a bit lower, which will make a lot of front of house mixers uh, my concert uh, happy because I, they were always complaining I gave too much signal, especially uh, connected with the motor and, and some of those interfaces. Uh, but it, it gives a, a little bit more space um, for, well, headroom as I said. 
it seems there is a little bit, uh, Robert and I are both uh, uh, nagging uh, with Frank a little bit, there seems to be a little dynamic change in sounds. This is all a prototype, it's experimentation. Uh, Frank actually told me there is a, a, some kind of limiting going on. So we, we are experimenting ourselves, but we will also be very happy to get feedback from you if you start using this. So really to realize this is a prototype. The, uh, and I think uh, I will use, probably if I feel secure enough, I will use it uh, in the concert on Wednesday night. And uh, it, uh, I don't use the screen actually during a concert to look at, so you might not even see the computer, but I'm almost sure I will use it. I'll let you know honestly about it, if you can't see it, if it's hidden. But um, um, what is important is to, to understand what we're doing. So basically we wanted this engine to run, because basically it means that for some of you who have the new machines, you will be able to, to perform with it. And, and if you want to edit, there's an extra step opening the other program, but I, you know, it's a temporary thing. The new thing is that um, we're going to build something under this and something on top of it. The on top level is really not intended for you guys, I would almost say. It's really made for, uh, it will have a lot of presets with, uh, with predefined relationships between gestures because junction is involved there. Uh, it's really meant for artists and people who do installations because we're, we're analyzing the kind of uh, you know, common denominator in presets and we're finding there are, there is a number of like maybe 14, 15 presets with which a lot of people could work. And uh, it's, it's also a little bit because we do these workshops, we see that it will help people to get into it uh, quicker. These are people who don't want to get into this stuff very deeply. They really see it you know, as a black box almost. They put sensors in and they have an idea for an installation and can there be such and such relationship between the gestures. Now, there is a whole kind of fast food approach in going to cater these kind of uh, desires. And uh, uh, I'm personally very critical, and, uh, but we see that uh, with the workshop there is a need. It will also save us time to help, you know, meet more people to get on the road because a lot of people really don't want to spend so much time as we all do in, in you know, learning to, to deal with this kind of stuff. So there's going to be a level on top which has, a, a, you know, a series of presets that, that will cater to what we think are things people need and we will for sure add stuff stuff that we really like when we should think